We will get started. Hello and welcome. My name is Nicole Milano, and I'm one of the engineering outreach coordinators at Ontario Tech Engineering. I am excited to welcome everyone virtually today to the 2022 Future City Experience Showcase. This year, over 2,500 students in grades six to eight from across Canada have signed up to participate in the Future City Experience. You have been asked to design and build a futuristic lunar city by putting on your engineering caps and applying the engineering design process. Today, as we are here to recognize your amazing designs as you share and showcase the hard work you have put into this project within your designs, we're excited to see your creativity, resourcefulness, and determination all of which are key things we look for in our future engineers. Before we start today, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are in while we meet today on a virtual platform. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the land which we are all call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improving our own understanding of local indigenous peoples and their culture. From coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territories of all the Anui, Métis, and First Nation peoples that call this nation home. Please join me in a moment of reflection to acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and to consider how we are and how each of us can, in our own way, try to move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. To kick off today's event, I would like to introduce the three organizations that made today's event possible, specifically Ontario Tech University, Engineers Canada, and Engineers of Tomorrow. Here to represent Ontario Tech University is Dr. Megan Cheres Finn, Assistant Professor of the Faculty of Engineering and Applied Science. Welcome, Dr. Cheres Finn, and I would like to pass it along to you. Thank you very much, Nicole. On behalf of the Faculty of Ontario Tech University, I'd like to, I would like to express congratulations to everyone who's participated in this program. I can't wait to see the, uh, the expression of originality and engineering on these undoubtedly amazing future cities that you've built. Uh, we're all excited to see the concepts that you've come up with to identify and solve the problems that you could imagine uh, when thinking of an extraterrestrial home base for human life. Thanks again for participating, everyone. I think we're gonna have a fun afternoon. And with that, I'll let Nicole play us a small video of Ontario Tech. Thank you. Ontario Tech Engineering is empowering students to solve the world's most complex problems and to engineer a bright new future. Gain hands-on engineering design experience in one of our design-focused engineering programs and our many student design teams. Take your entrepreneurial ideas from prototype to reality in our engineering design studios. Get a market-driven and career-oriented education in one of our state-of-the-art teaching and research labs. Expand your learning outside the classroom and customize your experience. Find something that ignites your passion in one of our many engineering clubs and societies. Turn your laptop into a computer lab. Our leading edge engineering software is available at your fingertips, wherever you go. Meet your future employer. Get real world engineering experience and accelerate your career goals through our co-op and internship program. Learn from and work with leading edge researchers in emerging fields such as autonomous vehicles, renewable energy, and artificial intelligence. Say hello to engineering at Ontario Tech University. Hi everyone. Uh, I wanna thank you so much for joining us uh, at the Future City Experience Showcase. My name is Rebecca White. I am the CEO of Engineers of Tomorrow. We're a national nonprofit that specializes in engineering outreach for kindergarten to grade 12 students. 
And my goal here today is that all of you leave this event even more curious and more excited about engineering. I'm very honored to share with you a special message from our partners, Engineers Canada. Hello, and welcome to this year's Future City Experience. My name is Gerard McDonald, and I'm an engineer and the CEO of Engineers Canada, the national association that works on behalf of the provincial and territorial associations that regulate engineering and license the country's 300,000 engineers. Hello, everyone. I'm Jeanette Southwood. I'm also an engineer, and I'm the Vice President of Corporate Affairs and Strategic Partnerships for Engineers Canada. When my team at Engineers Canada first brought the Future City Program to Canada in 2017, we never imagined how it would transform from a small Engineers Canada run initiative into an entirely virtual program that is being run in collaboration with Engineers of Tomorrow and Ontario Tech University. Together, we are creating positive engineering experiences for students across Canada helping to ensure the sustainability and diversity of the engineering profession so that engineers can continue to serve and protect all Canadians. We want to thank all the educators and youth that are participating today from across Canada. Designing a future city on the moon is no easy feat. There are many technical, logistical and environmental challenges that need to be solved. As engineers, it is our job to solve complex problems like the one you and your classmates have been working on for the last four months. And we're all excited for you to share your designs with us today. We also want to thank the people behind the scenes who made today possible. Specifically, we'd like to give a big shout out to Kim Buffard, Engineer Canada's Manager of Outreach and Engagement, who brought all the partners together to create the Future City Experience. And to Rebecca White, CEO of Engineers of Tomorrow, and Ellen James and the whole outreach team at Ontario Tech University. Without their creativity and passion to engage and inspire youth, today would not be possible. We hope you all enjoy this year's Future City Experience Showcase. And we look forward to working with you all again next year on a new challenge that will be revealed later today. All right, so before we get into today's events, I would like to introduce you to the planning team that has been working together to bring all of you here today. So Kim Buffard, you see on your screen there, uh, the Manager of Outreach and Engagement for Engineers Canada, myself and my team at Engineers of Tomorrow. And we have, of course, Ellen James and McCool Milanu and the entire outreach team at Ontario Tech University. Uh, University. <laughs> we are all so excited to welcome you here today. I know many of you have been working very hard over the last few months to design and build a city, a model of a city, 100 years in the future. And that is quite a complex challenge. So I hope you're proud of what you've accomplished. And we wanted to do something special, something very special to celebrate your achievements. So we've invited a special guest speaker who we hope will inspire you as you navigate your own futures. If you could please join me in welcoming Canadian Space Agency astronaut Joshua Kutrick. Josh's dedication and perseverance has gotten him where he is today. After completing a two-year astronaut candidate training program, he officially earned the title of astronaut in January of 2020. As I'm sure he'll tell you, it was a lot of hard work to get there. Josh has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering, master's in space studies, a master's in flight test engineering, and a master's in defense studies. In his free time, he enjoys backcountry skiing, cycling, mountaineering, and paragliding. Please join me again in welcoming Josh Kutrick to our virtual stage. Thank you, Megan. Is it okay if, and Rebecca and, and everyone else for the introduction? And I'm just uh, gonna wait and make sure we're okay. Looks like we're okay. 
All right. Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you for being here. Bonjour à tous. It's it's wonderful for me to to be able to come together with you virtually and talk for a few minutes this morning about some of my favorite things. Exploring uh, and engineering would be among those. You heard it already, but I did study engineering, mechanical engineering, and then flight test engineering, and a, and a couple of other things. Um, congratulations on your design so far, and thank you for your participation. I. I think it's a wonderful experience what you've been able to be involved with this idea of cities in in a hundred years and what they could look like you know here on earth as well but also on the moon is something fascinating to me i like to think about what it would be like you know if you were in europe before anyone had crossed the ocean and and sit there and wonder what it might be like what a city might look like and where you might be able to have cities a hundred years from now i don't think anyone could ever predict that uh, and in this case, I, I for one certainly think that 100 years from now we'll have humans uh, living permanently on the moon. I, I think we're likely to see permanent presence there a lot sooner than that, actually. And I'll get into that a little bit in what I'm going to talk about here. So a couple of pictures I'll throw up. Thank you, folks. All right. So this is a quick introduction to me. Yeah, I'm an astronaut now with the Canadian Space Agency. I'm speaking to you from Houston. That's where I live and work. Uh, been down here for a number of years. But of course, it's still kind of new to me, this idea of, of being a Canadian Space Agency astronaut. Before this, I was a test pilot. Uh, before that, I was a fighter pilot. And before that, I did, uh, did a lot of working. I think that uh, becoming an astronaut takes a lot of things. It certainly takes a lifelong dedication to, to, to hard work, uh, and to something that you're passionate about. For me, it was flying and engineering. I think it also takes a little bit of luck. Um, but you know, I, I certainly remember being, even as a, a child, very interested in space, very curious about the world around me, and, and having this ever-present longing to explore. Um, and I think I, you know, those are items that still make me me, and I think those are, are things that led to my studies, led to some of uh, what I did with engineering and then uh, ultimately led to, to where I am now. Um, you know, to become an astronaut in Canada is is difficult. You're, you have to be a little bit lucky, like I said. We don't recruit that often. So uh, we had a selection in 2009 that I applied for. I, I wasn't successful. And then we had another selection in 2016, 17, uh, which I applied for and that time was successful uh, somehow, something that I'm very grateful for. The selection process is is long, it's very challenging. It takes place over about a year. There's lots of, of challenging tests. Uh, every day is a surprise. Uh, and every day leaves you feeling uh, miserable, frankly. Leaves you feeling like you failed and like uh, without a doubt, the next morning you're gonna get the phone call uh, saying, asking you not to come back, basically that that's the end of the road for you. Um, and so it's really a test uh, on your personality and on how I think you deal with, with challenge, how you manage risk, how you deal with disappointment and failure, uh, sort of, and are able to pick yourself up and, and keep going again. Um, but in any case, I was, I was selected, uh, very grateful for the opportunity to join this group. So this is the, the four current Canadian astronaut corps. Uh, you see myself in the middle. I was hired with Jenny Saidi Gibbons, who's just there on the inner left of your screen. Uh, David St. Jacques is on the right. He just came back from uh, about seven months in space and Jeremy Hansen's on the left. And this photograph is taken down here at Houston uh, where we, we live and work right now. These are some of the airplanes that we fly and that you can see in the background there. So, you know, the question is what happens after you do all that preparation and you do all that selection and then you're, you're selected uh, well, the first thing you do is you go back to school. And that's why uh, of all the things that you have to be, I think, to be successful in this job, uh, one of the most important is you have to enjoy learning. Uh, that's for sure. So you move to Houston and you start a program that's about two and a half or three years long. It's just like going back into university. Um, you do a lot of learning. So we're going to cover everything from you know the intricacies of the space station and some of the launch vehicles that we use. Uh, we, we learn a lot of technical things. We learn a lot of practical things as well, like spacewalking, like operating in microgravity. Uh, you see some of those in the pictures here. We learn survival skills. Um, we start flying. We do a lot of flying on the T-38. We learn Russian, so we learn other languages. We do a lot of traveling. Uh, but 
you know, at the end of the day, it's a lot of learning, uh, a lot of testing. And then at the end of it, as was mentioned, uh, you graduate with the, the certification of a, a NASA astronaut. So this is a photograph of the, the group that I was lucky enough to graduate with here a couple of years ago. This is the 22nd NASA astronaut class. Uh, there's two Canadians in here, myself, you'll see, and Jenny, and then the rest are, are American NASA astronauts. Um, two of these folks just came back actually from space a couple of days ago, and another two of them just launched to space, so they're up there now, and they'll be up for probably seven or eight months. Um, there's a picture of the moon in the background, and we're going to come back to this here in a few minutes because uh, this is really what NASA and its partners like the Canadian Space Agency are working on right now. That's the next step, which is to go to the moon, um, and it's something that that is being put into action here. The gears are turning uh, in the 2020s right now, in fact, and Canada's involved, uh, which is pretty exciting. So a long story, but all that to say, um, as you think about future cities, this is something that's happening now, and I think that... Um, some of the people, for example, in this photograph are very likely to be uh, to be on the surface of the moon and and taking some of those very initial steps uh, towards having future people living there um, in the years to come. We're talking the next five or 10 years, which is pretty fascinating stuff. Um, so, you know, that's my my story real quickly. What do I do now? Well, uh, we're, we're preparing for future Canadian missions. And what that means if you're a Canadian astronaut down here is you do two main things. You continue to train. This is a photograph of that. This is uh, during a three week space analog mission where we're basically doing uh, science in a, in a very high risk, high consequence environment. This is a, an unexplored cave system underneath Slovenia in Europe. We were down there for a three week period with an international group of, of astronauts um, doing this science. Uh, basically kind of simulating what, what some of these future expeditions in space might look like. So we continue to train. We get to do, do really awesome things like this. Um, another picture of training. This is the in the uh, microgravity lab, the neutral buoyancy facility here in Houston, which is the world's largest swimming pool. It has a ginormous model of the uh, real size model, in fact, of the International Space Station in it. Spent a lot of time training down there in, in the space suits, which you see in this photograph. Um, but we also work, and so all astronauts here at NASA fill ground positions, technical roles that are filled by astronauts of a, a wide variety. You know, the truth of the matter is, and, and they don't tell you this during selection, but any astronaut, our day-to-day -day work is, is mostly, if you look at the career of an astronaut, I mean, it's going to be 99% here on the ground, most of that in Houston, um, supporting missions, supporting activities in low Earth orbit. Um, being the, the voice and helping to oversee some of the more complex things that we do in orbit. That's what this picture is from. It's a photograph of me in Mission Control Houston, uh, working with the, the vast engineering team that, that is on, on console, as we say, on shift here every day, 24-7, has been for 24 hours a day, uh, forever really, since the space station started flying for over 20 years now, making those day-to-day -day operations happen. Um, we're involved a lot in the test and development of new technologies that are going to space. Uh, we help solve problems. So when something on the space station breaks, uh, we're parts of the part of the teams that come together here on the ground to design the fixes. You know that that's very engineering centric work, of course, and then to, to test the designs and then to to redesign them to give you a flavor of, of some of what we do on a day to day basis here in Houston. Um, there's never a dull moment, though, is, is probably the best way to think about it. Uh, have to include this, a, a quick photograph. This is the International Space Station, of course. Uh, it's, what you see in this photo is about the size of a football field. Uh, you can see some robotic components hanging off it, like Canadarm2, which, of course, were, were put there, designed. All that engineering effort came from within Canada. Um, Canada is a prime partner on the space station, one of five major partners. Um, we're, we're lucky to have that. And I think that as a country, we're lucky to be in this position whereby we've cultivated uh, certain technologies, innovations, uh, particularly as you see in this photograph that are related to robotic systems um, that really don't exist anywhere else in the world. Uh, we've used that technology to help build this, which is, is maybe one of the, the single most complicated things humans beings have ever built. Um, and because of that, we get to participate in this program. So we get to send astronauts here uh, on a fairly regular basis. Um, and, we, and we get to benefit from that, to benefit from the science and the research 
and then engineering innovation that that happens because of our participation on the space station, all of which uh, we bring back and, and apply to different problems here on Earth. I want to talk uh, for a few minutes here at the end about what that next step is, though. So you, you can see in this photograph at the bottom, you see the curvature of Earth. And that's where we've been working for the last 20 years. We've been building this amazing thing. We're now sustaining humans. There's been permanent human uh, presence on the International Space Station for over 20 years. We've learned how to, to keep humans alive there. We've learned how to make re recycle water almost entirely, for example. We've learned how to come and go. We've learned how to, a lot about protecting people from the, the dangers of space, the vacuum, the radiation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but as we get near the end of that, this permanent 20 plus year uh, experiment really in low Earth orbit. NASA's next big step, which they're taking right now, is to the next destination. It's the moon, which of course you see in the middle of the maple leaf there. And the whole idea is to take what we've done around Earth in low Earth orbit, to move that out to the moon, to do science and engineering on the moon for a number of 10, 10 years probably. And then ultimately, not too far away actually, to take that and go the next giant leap, which is all the way out to Mars. Uh, and the distances, of course, are, are extraordinary to think about. In low Earth orbit right now, everything that we do on a daily basis uh, mostly is within about, you know, a couple hundred miles of the surface of the Earth. That's why we call it low Earth orbit. We're talking about going, you know, like a thousand times that to the moon, right? We're going from 200 miles to 250,000 miles. And then when we talk about taking that all and moving it out to Mars, we're talking all of a sudden about 90 million miles. Uh, and so these are huge leaps for us as a species, for our, our innovation. Um, and I, I just think it's very, very cool for, to think about the fact that we're alive at this moment when, when humans are, are taking these steps. Um, a little bit about Canada's involvement, maybe. So Canada, that's the, the thing that I'm most proud about right now. The Canadian Space Agency is involved in this next step. We're partnered with NASA on this. This is called the Lunar Gateway. Um, it's a space station that's being designed and built right now. I can leave this building here in Houston and walk a couple buildings down and, and see this being developed and tested right now. It's a space station that's going to be launched into orbit around the moon and then and then built in orbit around the moon. Uh, we're starting with the first launches in a couple years. Um, Canada has a major, major role to play in this construction. We're building, designing, innovating right now in Canada. Um, the technology, the robotic AI technology, robotic technology that's going to help to put this thing together and then to sustain it. So we have a very leading role in the development of this outpost, the Lunar Gateway around the moon, as we did with the International Space Station. Um, and I think that that's something, you know, that that's very exciting. Uh, for those of you who are who are young and thinking about a career in, in space someday, I mean, this this is an indication uh, that we're going to have in Canada a lot of opportunity in space, uh, be it, you know, of course, uh, as an astronaut, but but also be it uh, in terms of all the engineering and scientific horsepower that goes into building something like this. Uh, there's roughly, I would say, 20,000-ish positions right now in Canada that are are directly involved day to day in in building things for space and the engineering effort that goes into helping space happen across the full spectrum of what we do out there. Um, and that's something that's going to increase markedly, of course, as we take this step out to the moon. Um, this is what the next couple years look like. So the gateway is what we're building around the moon, what Canada's helping to build. Artemis refers to the missions, the launches that are going to go to the moon and back. Uh, and these three, Artemis 1, 2, and 3, are really right on the doorstep. So Artemis 1, um, I'll fly from here to Florida fairly frequently, uh, which is where the launch pad for this is. This vehicle is built, it's constructed, it's stacked on the beach in Florida waiting to fly. It's going to fly later this summer. And Artemis 1 will be uh, this vehicle going out to the moon and back without a crew, basically an uncrewed test flight of all this architecture. Uh, once it comes back, we'll start getting ready for Artemis 2. That's going to be a repeat flight to the moon and back, but this time it will have astronauts on it. And the interesting thing is that one of those astronauts will be Canadian. So three NASA astronauts, one Canadian. This will be the first time uh, that any humans have gone back to the moon since Apollo. And it will actually be the farthest and the fastest that any human being has ever gone. 
uh, which is kind of cool to think about the fact uh, that we'll have a Canadian on board. Artemis 3 uh, will probably be all Americans again, I would guess, but that will be the moon landing and that's expected to, to occur in about 2025, the next moon landing with people on the moon. Uh, and then after that, we'll, we'll see these launches continue, uh, hopefully fairly regularly as we build up the sustainable presence and ex exploration effort uh, on the moon, on the south pole of the moon. Uh, Canada's building a, a lunar rover just to give you some some indication of what the engineering efforts the CSA is involved with right now. Uh, we're launching a rover to the moon here within the next five years. This is a, a pictorial of what it could end up looking like. It's being designed right now. Uh, there's two companies that are working on different proposals, but this is going to go to the south pole of the moon, which is where NASA intends to do some of these initial landings. Um, it's going to try to explore that area for resources that we can use there for future uh, propulsion, for example, and sustainability. Um, it's going to try to sustain a lunar a lunar night, which is 14 days. That's no no small task. It has to be able to operate in temperatures down to uh, less than minus 200 degrees. Um, and then it's it's going to teach us things about that environment and about what we we have to do to be able to land and operate there with humans. Uh, but in an entirely Canadian uh, innovation, and uh, that's something else that I think is is pretty neat to think that we're gonna have this Canadian technology built by Canadian companies, by Canadian engineers, uh, again, taking these very initial steps towards having cities on the moon. And this is, like I say, not science fiction. This is happening in the next four or five years. We also work at the Canadian Space Agency and with engineers across the country on uh, healthcare in space. This is a, a big challenge that we're trying to solve for the moon, how to keep people healthy, how to deliver remote medicine to a place that's 400,000 kilometers away. Uh, and of course, everything that we work on with this also has a lot of application to problems that we're trying to solve here on Earth. Uh, another example is food production. Uh, we actually have, through the Canadian Space Agency, uh, labs set up in the Arctic right now, 250 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle, where we're experimenting and developing the means by which we can grow food uh, and sustain human beings off of that food in environments that, you know, you would never think you could, could grow food. And the whole idea here is to apply that technology and that innovation to solving major problems on Earth, like food management and supply, um, but also to solving some of the, the, the biggest problems we have with sustained lunar presence, which of course, one of them is, is resources, in situation food supply uh, and things of that sort. So quickly just wanted to give you an, an overview of, of kind of uh, some of the, the most exciting things I think that we have happening right now at the Canadian Space Agency. And in this effort to, to take the next step, I'll leave you with this slide uh, and then turn the, turn the mic back over. But uh, if you walk away with one thing, I hope that you'll remember this. It shows our home where we've been for our entire history. Um, we're about to take in the next 10 years, that next big step to the moon. Canada's playing a major role. Uh, and that's something that, that I'm just so proud of. Um, but the real exciting part is that the next step after that, the one that goes all the way out to that little red dot called Mars, uh, is, you know, the window on that is open now. And I, when I'm asked, I, I think it's valid to say uh, that the first people to walk on that planet are, are certainly alive today. They're younger than I am. They're probably the age that many of you are. They're in middle school somewhere. Um, but this is something that's going to happen in this generation. Uh, and I think it's just wonderful that, that we might get the opportunity uh, to be a part of that. So, um, thank you again for, for listening. Congrats on your participation in this event. It's important stuff. Uh, and the fact that we have so many thousands of people across the country like you who are passionate about engineering at such a, such a young age, uh, that just warms my heart. That's something that's very important to our future prosperity as a country. So keep it up. And uh, thanks again. I will say so long for now and, and turn our virtual mic back over to the organizers. Thanks everyone. Don't, don't leave yet, Josh, don't leave yet. We've got a few okay, questions. I'm not <laughs> if you've got a few minutes, I think I we have, have a few tons minutes. Of time. Yeah. Amazing. Um, I can tell, uh, first of all, thank you. That was just incredible. So inspiring. You, you just blew my mind with that idea that the people, there's people on earth today that one day will be 
will be walking on Mars. That's I just find that incredible. And I can tell you've inspired everyone else that is uh, joining us today because I get the uh, privilege of seeing all the questions that have been coming in. So I've got a few here that I'll um, pass along to you. Um, and these ones are a bit of a, a sequence, I guess, in terms of your progression. Um, so the first one is, uh, what made you want to become an astronaut? And then how, how did you feel when you finally heard that news that you made it in, in 2017? And then what's your favorite thing about space? Let's start there. Okay. Um, yeah, why I wanted to be an astronaut. It, uh, I think it goes back to, to some very fundamental things that I mentioned. I've always been very, very curious. I remember even as a young age, everything I looked at, I wanted to understand, know the science behind it know the engineering that went into building it. Um, and then the second item for me has always been this desire to explore. Uh, I, I, st I still have that. I, I love mountaineering. I love going to new places. I love working in a place like this, Johnson Space Center, because that's what people here do uh, from an engineering point of view. They explore and they look for new technologies. They look for ways to take the you know, impossible and make it possible. And so for me, the job of, of becoming an astronaut combined those it's something I always wanted to do. I, I think I was kind of shy of admitting it as a child because I've always realized that it's very, very difficult uh, and it does take a lot of hard work, but it also takes a lot of luck. Um, so I never wanted to define my life on whether or not I, I became someone who wore this blue suit or not. I always thought it was a, a very good goal to have anyway uh, because it would help you make decisions through your life. And it's turned out to be to be very useful for that. Um, how did I feel in uh, 2017? Two things, uh, very excited, of course, to be offered the opportunity to join this wonderful team, but also very proud. And I hope I conveyed some of that to you in, um, the, in the presentation. I'm very proud of Canada's involvement and I'm very optimistic for the fact, for the future, um, for the, when I think about the roles that Canada, Canadian companies, Canadian engineers, are going to play in, in doing some of this really hard stuff. Um, it's it's good news for me, and I'm I'm proud to be on the Canadian on the Canadian team. Uh, you also asked me one more. What uh, the third question was? Favorite thing about space. Favorite thing about probably space. Probably hard one. <laughs> yeah, I think you know the the my favorite. Th this might be a little philosophical, but my favorite thing about space is that it's it's really really hard. We have to do the hard things. Um, because if we don't, we stop progressing. And you know, it's not too early for you to think about this. If, if we don't continue to push ourselves, be it as individuals or as countries, if we don't continue to do the really hard things, we don't keep trying to do things that we always thought would be impossible, um, then, then we just, we stagnate. And there's nothing that says our, our human trajectory, just our lives just keep getting better. Uh, that's on us. We have to do that. We have to keep exploring. And I think that's my favorite thing about space is the fact that it's really hard. It's the fact that we are doing exactly that, trying to take the impossible and make it possible. I so I, an engineering outreach program instructor. Awesome. Thanks, Ruby. Um, so like I said, we're going to be playing a space trivia game um, through Kahoot. Uh, we're going to be using Kahoot to basically just keep track of your names. Um, so if you want to be eligible to win a prize at the end of the Kahoot session, just make sure to put your for first and last um, legal name into the chat. So let's get started. I'm going to stop sharing the screen so I can upload my the Kahoot game. All right. Ruby, can you see? Awesome. So yeah, the game pin is 801. 3717. Again, make sure to use your first and last name if you want to be eligible for a prize. So we'll give everyone about five to ten ish minutes to get everyone into the, the game. All right, I think we'll begin now. I think we have a good amount of players. So let's start. So welcome, welcome everyone to the Future City Space Cahoots. We're just gonna go over some rules before we get started. I'll pass it over to Ruby. Yes, so we have three basic rules for our Kahoot today. So the first one is please do not search up um, any of the answers to the questions just so it can be fair. 
Um, and also please use your real first and last name so that you can be considered for the prize at the end. And the last rule, of course, is to have fun. We're super excited. Awesome, thanks Ruby. So let's start off with the first question. What is the third planet in the solar system? Is it Mercury? Is it Saturn? Mars or Earth? You have about 12 seconds left. Awesome. So yeah, it is Earth. So uh, kind of like a fun little way of reminding yourself the order of the planets is my very excellent mom just served us noodles for Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Next question. Here's our le uh, leaderboard. We got Carlos up first. All right, so how many planets can be seen without a, micro a telescope? Is it five, zero, eight, or one? And the correct answer is five. So, um, I see Carlos is still in the lead, awesome. So the visible planets, um, so there are five planets we can see with the naked eye, which means without a device like a telescope. And these planets include Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. And these planets are often visible at different times of the year. And there's some tools you can use like the Skyview Light app, I highly recommend, um, and it lets you find them at nighttime. Awesome. So who was the first woman in space? Was it Julie Patiet, Roberta Bondiar, Sally Ride, or Judith uh, Resnick? Awesome. So it was Roberta Bondiar. Um, something really interesting about her is that not only was she born in Canada, she was actually born in Ontario. So she was born in Sault Ste. Marie, and she was the first Canadian woman in space when she traveled on Discovery uh, on January 20, 1982. So a neurologist, researcher, and photographer. Okay, next question. So which planet has supersonic winds? Is it Neptune, Saturn, Earth, or Mars? So I think we have a bit more time for this question. So think. Sorry. <laughs> so we have more time to think about it. So which planet has supersonic winds? For those of you who don't know, supersonic winds um, is wind faster than the speed of sound, which is 785 miles per hour. So it's like super fast. Okay, and the correct answer is Neptune. And on Neptune, wind speeds can actually be up to 12,000 miles per hour. So that's almost double um, the speed of sound. And that's actually about 40 times the speed of the average tornado. So it's very, very fast. Awesome, so we're gonna watch a little video now on keeping healthy in space. Um, it's presented by Dr. Cassandra Marion, uh, science advisor at the Canadian Aviation Space uh, Museum. So everyone knows it's important to stay healthy, stay in shape while on planet Earth. But in space, it's far more important that you exercise 
because astronauts have to counteract the negative effects of weightlessness on the human body. That is, when in space or in orbit, um, astronauts tend to lose bone density, which is really important, uh, muscle mass, because they're not really working their muscles uh, as hard as they're floating around, and cardiovascular health. That basically means your, your heart health, because the heart is a big muscle, it's not working that muscle as hard either. So they need to reduce the deterioration of their bones, maintain the strength of their muscles, and maintain their heart health. And to do that, astronauts work out two hours every day uh, in a space gym, which has three exercise machines that simulate the gravitational pull that they would experience, um, or something like what they would experience on Earth. And so those three machines are uh, a resistance machine uh, that allows the astronauts to do strength training, like squats and deadlifts and calf raises. There's a treadmill that looks pretty much like a normal treadmill, but there's a harness and bungees that hold them down onto it. And then the third thing is a stationary bicycle, except for it's more like uh, they're floating over pedals in the air. There's no seat and there's no handlebars. They're sort of attached at the waist and, and hold on behind them and it, and it makes for a great cardio workout. Um, so astronauts stay healthy while in space uh, and uh, the healthier they stay in space, the, the speedier their recovery once they're back on Earth. So stay healthy. Awesome. So that was just a little clip illustrating um, how astronauts stay healthy in space and kind of what they could experience when they are in space. So now we're going to answer a few questions related to the video. Yeah. So first question is, if astronauts do not exercise, what could happen to their body? Do they decrease in bone density? Do their muscle mass decrease? Maybe their heart health decrease or maybe all of above? What do you think happens? Awesome. So yeah, it's all of the above. So when you're in space, you're not moving and then it's that lack of um, uh, gravity. So astronauts need to constantly be working out and exercising their body to maintain these um, proper functions, which leads us to our next question. What machines do astronauts use to exercise in space? Is it resistant machines, treadmills, stationary bikes, or all of them? Awesome. So yeah, it is actually all of them. So astronauts use all three of these machines to stay healthy in space. We have our leaderboard. Eva's in first place. Awesome. Great job, guys. All right. So uh, our next question is, what is the coldest planet in the solar system? Is it Uranus? Is it Neptune? Is it Saturn? Or is it Mars? Coldest planet. Okay, and the correct answer is Uranus. So, Uranus is the coldest planet in the solar system with temperatures below 225 degrees Celsius. So, in comparison, the coldest temperature on Earth is only about uh, minus 90 degrees Celsius. So, a lot colder. All right, so next question. How long would it take to drive to the moon? Do you think six days, 10 days, six months, or maybe even three weeks? What does everyone think? Awesome, so yeah, it is six months. And actually, fun fact, um, within six months in this time, we could drive around the Earth about 10 times, which is insane. Leaderboard again, great job. Okay, and the next question is, in this picture, what is the long light mechanism called? You may have seen it before, very famous. Okay, 
And yes, the correct answer is the Canada arm. And a little bit about it is uh, the Canada arm is used to transfer cargo and release satellites on the International Space Station. And it was actually the first of its kind and was built in Canada, which is super cool. All right, next question. So how many Earths can fit into the sun? 2,000, maybe only two, 4.5 billion or 1.3 million? Awesome. So yeah, the correct answer is 1.3 million. So 1.3 million um, Earths can fit into the sun. Okay, and what is the scientific name of a shooting star? Is it a meteor, a comet, an asteroid, or a fireball? Yeah, so the correct answer is a meteor. And a meteor is made up of silicon and oxygen and heavier metals like nickel and iron. All right, so which is the smallest planet in our solar system? Is it Mercury, is it Pluto, is it Mars, or is it Venus? Awesome, good job everyone. So yeah, it is Mercury. So actually a fun fact, uh, at one point Pluto was the ninth planet. So it was considered the smallest planet, but is no longer considered um, one of the nine, nine or eight planets. Um, so now it is Mercury. Okay, and compared to um, Earth, like how long is one year on Jupiter? Is it two Earth minutes? Is it 1,000 Earth years? Is it 10 Earth days? Or is it 12 Earth years? Yeah, so it's 12 Earth years. So a bit about how this works is orbital periods, which is the amount of time it takes a planet to go around the sun. And Earth takes one year, so that's 365 days to orbit the sun. But planets closer to the sun have smaller orbital periods. So their um, orbital periods are shorter. And planets further from the sun, like Jupiter, have larger orbital periods. And an example of the largest, uh, the planet with the longest orbital period is Neptune. And a year on Neptune is actually equivalent to 164.8 Earth years. That's a long time. All right. So how do indigenous people across Turtle Island, also referred to as North America, use stars? So do they use them for storytelling, for guidance, for spiritual identity, or all of the above? So how do indigenous people across Turtle Island use stars? Awesome, yeah. So indigenous people use stars for multiple reasons. Um, storytelling, uh, for guidance, and uh, spiritual identity is just one of the three. Um, it also can be used for navigation across uh, different geographical uh, locations. Okay, and which famous pizza company has delivered pizza to the International Space Station? So for those pizza lovers out there, maybe you know. Okay, 
place. Yeah, it's Pizza Hut. So back in 2001, Pizza Hut became the first restaurant train uh, to deliver to space. And the pizza was sent to the International Space Station um, on board a resupply rocket. Looking good, awesome. All right, so what is the largest planet in the solar system? We have Jupiter, Mars, Earth, or Venus. So out of those four, what is the largest planet in our solar system? Awesome, so yes, it is Jupiter. Okay, and the planet Uranus has only been visited by what spacecraft? Is it Orbiter 2000, Rover 15, the Voyager 2, or the Lander spacecraft? Remember, Uranus is the coldest planet. Yes, so the correct answer is the Voyager 2. All right, so who was the first indigenous astronaut from Turtle Island to travel to space? Also, Turtle Island also just first to North America. So was it Alanis, Tattoo, Jody, or John? Awesome, so yeah, it was John Harrington. I'm just gonna update our leaderboard and have a bit of information about John. So yeah, back in 2002, um, John Harrington, which he was a member of the Chickasaw Nation, became the first indigenous person on Turtle Island to travel to space. Um, so basically the Chickasaw Nation is, um, I believe, not in Canada, but it is in, the, um, in America somewhere. I believe more Northern America. But yeah, he was the first indigenous person uh, from Turtle Island to travel to space. All right. And for the next question, what planet is known as the morning and evening star? Is it Venus, Saturn, Earth, or Uranus? Okay, so... It is actually Venus, and Venus is called the morning and evening star because it shines so brightly, um, because it's usually the first star to appear in the sky after the sun sets or the last to disappear before the sun arises. So, yeah. Awesome. So, which are the four gas giant planets in our solar system? Is it Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Jupiter, Earth, Uranus, Saturn, Saturn, Mars, Venus, or and Earth, or none of the above? This is the last question. But choose wisely. <laughs> awesome. So yes, it is Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. So yes, this was the last question. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Um, I believe it will show us the, yes, the podium. Top three, let's go. All right, we got Cameron in third place, Carlos in second. Drum roll, please. And Ava in first, congratulations, everyone. You are all winners, so don't worry. But here's our top three. Um, you all will be directed for prizes later on. So thank you for joining us. All right. Welcome back, everyone. I hope that you have enjoyed the last few hours here at the Future City Experience Showcase, and you are even more excited and curious to explore the world of engineering. I know after what I have seen here today that all of you are up for the challenge again next year. 
So with that, I am very excited because we are going to be announcing next year's, so the 2023 Future City Experience Challenge. All right, amazing. Zero waste for next year. Very exciting, hot topic these days for sure. So we will wrap up today's event with some very special thank yous. First, thank you to all of the partner organizations that have been so dedicated to making this the best possible experience for all of you here today. And Thank you again to our special guest, Josh Kutrick, for sharing his insights and wisdom and inspiring the next generation. Now, a big shout out to all of the engineer mentors who have been there to encourage you along the way and hopefully help you understand just a little bit more about just what it means to be an engineer. And a special thank you to Ontario Tech University's outreach team. The program coordinators were just fantastic today. We appreciate everything that you have done to make sure that everyone had a great time today. And of course, let's please give a big round of applause to your teachers. They really are going above and beyond to expose all of you, all the students to the different pathways and opportunities for your future. And last but definitely not least, thank you to each and every student for your hard work and dedication to this challenge. Engineers are solving complex problems to help protect people and keep them safe, healthy, and happy. And we need people just like you so that engineers will be able to continue to serve and protect all Canadians. And with that, we will wrap up. I hope that we see all of you back again next year. Thanks so much, everyone.